<clears throat> Hello, my name is Luis Espino. I'm Rice Farming Systems Advisor in Calusa Glen and Yolo Counties. Um, and I'm going to be covering the diseases uh, of rice today. So diseases are caused by microorganisms such as fungi, uh, bacteria, and viruses. In California, we don't have viruses or bacteria causing diseases in rice. All of our diseases are uh, due to fungi. And because of our dry weather, lack of rainfall during the season, we don't have as many diseases as other parts of the world and even here in the southern United States where they get rainfall during uh, the growing season. So we just have a handful of uh, rice diseases. However, they can be in some cases very uh, severe and cause yield losses. So uh, this is an outline on when these diseases appear. And the main ones are these ones here in the, as uh, they happen during the seedling stage. Uh, they, we have a couple that happen during the uh, vegetative growth. And during the panicle uh, maturation stage, we have blast. And then there's a couple of really minor diseases that I'm just going to mention at the end of the talk. So we'll start with uh, what happens early in the season. We have uh, seedling disease and seed rot can attack uh, seeds and seedlings right after planting. And these are pathogens that, are, uh, that live in the soil. And when this, the soil, the field is flooded, uh, some of the, these pathogens produce spores that can actually swim, so spores, and move uh, and infect seed, seeds and seedlings. Uh, these diseases are favored by anything that will slow down the growth of, the, of rice seedlings. So especially cool conditions where you are uh, during a cool spell, the seeds are just sitting in the water, not doing anything, they're not growing. That gives plenty of opportunity for these pathogens to infect the, uh, the seeds or the seedlings. Once you get favorable, favorable conditions, uh, most of the time uh, the seedlings just continue growing and they, uh, they can overcome the disease. So what you'll see is this fung fungi, uh, fungi growth coming out of the seed. And this is as if you were looking in the water. Once you take these seeds out of the water, that uh, the pathogen growth, you won't see that because it kind of dries out real quick. And a lot of times what you'll see is that this is, gets all green because of the algae growing uh, on, on it. And also you'll see on the field uh, <clears throat> these dark rings around the infected seeds or seedlings. And what that is is uh, bacteria and algae growing on top of the, uh, of the mycelial growth of the fungus. Uh, growing out of the seed. Uh, there's really not much one can do if one's uh, uh, having a, an issue with uh, seedling disease. Um, everything's uh, prevention, uh, using good quality seed, uh, making sure that you have a good, uh, quick uh, establishment, so uh, laser leveling and uh, good four inch water uh, flood will help have a uniform stand that grows quickly and that tends to reduces the re that reduces the likelihood of having a, a seedling disease infection. Um, also very important is planting at the adequate timing. So a lot of growers like to plant as early as possible to avoid the risk of uh, coming into rains during harvest time. But you have to be careful with that. A lot of times, if it's too early, that we could have some really cool, uh, uh, cool periods of time, uh, and that will just don't that won't allow seeds to grow quick or get a quick stand establishment, and so you get more uh, more risk of uh, having this problem, seedling disease or seed rot. And then, if you have a history of uh, uh, of the field where you know you have a high incidence of this disease, you can increase your seeding rate to try to overcome for what you're going to lose. Um, but with the caveat that, uh, that Jim already mentioned, that increasing seeding rate can have detrimental effects too. And also it can affect other diseases as we're going to see later on. The next uh, disease that 
occurs at about this time too is bacony. Well, you can see it at this time, but actually uh, bacony can be seen all throughout the season. And I've, I've gone to fields that are tillering, uh, fields that are heading, and it's not until those times that you start seeing symptoms of bacony. So bacony is a disease uh, originally described in Japan, and so the name means foolish seedling. And that's because the pathogen produces these uh, hormones that make the, the seedlings grow long and spindly. Um, it was uh, in first found in California in 1999, and uh, it caused some trouble early on. Uh, but now it's really become a minor issue. Uh, we'll still see it in the field, and we'll, we'll go through that. So this is the typical sim back in the symptoms. So you see early on this very long uh, seedlings. These don't make it. They, most of them just die. But in some occasions, uh, so this, th this will happen later on in the season, and you'll, you'll see them grow uh, much taller than the rest of the plants. Uh, almost like a uh, uh, sprangle top. Um, sometimes you don't see that elongation, but what you see is these uh, uh, leaves that get flare up yellow, and you pull the plants and they just look normal, just they look like the other plants, they don't look elongated. Uh, but the, the tail sign of bacony, this is a healthy plant, this is an infected plant, is on the crown. So you cut the crown and you'll you'll see the discoloration because that crown is rotting away. Uh, later on, uh, if the plant survives, they, they might produce a panicle, but it's a blank panicle. Um, and uh, a lot of times you'll see this pinkish or white growth on the outside of the tillers, and that's just the fungus that's starting to sporulate. So what's worked for this disease is uh, the sodium, uh, a soak in a sodium hypochlorite solution, which is bleach or Clorox, and that's worked great reducing the incidence. Uh, we recommend a 5% solution uh, if you're going to soak your seed for two hours in this solution, or if you're going to do a 24-hour soak, use a 2.5% solution and then do a drain uh, for 24 hours. Um, Every year I go to a couple fields and uh, it, you know, I always wonder like why I see so much bacony in some fields and um, I ask growers, did you, treat, did you soak the seed with, uh, with Clorox and they did. And I think what happens is a lot of times the seed just after soaking and drying just sits there for more than 24 hours and that gives the pathogen a chance to reproduce and so you might, even though you treated the seed, you still you see more bacony than you would have if uh, you would have planted that seed right away after 24 hours of drain. But in general, I don't think we see yield reductions due to bacony anymore. We see fields where you, you will uh, easily see where the infected plants are, but um, it's nothing, uh, thanks to the seed soak, it's, it's nothing that, to, that will cause yield reductions. Just just to show how effective those, the treatment is, you can go without a treatment, you can have up to tw almost 20% incidence of the disease, and uh, with the treatment, you really go down to 2%, you really reduce it. So now we're moving into the uh, vegetative growth. Uh, the plants are tillering, that's when you start seeing stem rot. It's another pathogen uh, that lives in the soil. It, um, it survives on the crop residue, so it survives on the straw, and then it survives as an sclerotia. And sclerotia is just a resting stage of this fungus. And so when you flood the, the field, this sclerotia flowed, and then they can infect uh, the plants at the water, uh, at the water uh, level. Um, it is uh, favored by excess nitrogen, and that's how it looks at the beginning. It's just a small lesion at the water level. It's really dark. Um, and as time progresses, the lesion gets bigger. Um, and it starts penetrating into the column. So you'll see that the inner 
uh, leaf sheaths start getting the same lesion and then it can go all the way through the column killing the tiller and then you you might not get a panicle or if you do get a panicle it might be a blank panicle and that's what this sclerotia looks like so if you if you find some infected uh, plants if you go out about drain time and you peel some of those leaf sheaths you're going to find these uh, small they're uh, almost like uh, weed seeds but um, they're inside the tissue and they're uh, that's how the fungus survives and uh, makes it to the next season. So management is really based on how you manage your crop residue. Um, anything you do to reduce the amount of uh, uh, residue that sits there in the field and is available for next year without decomposing uh, will help. So burning, uh, straw removal, um, or incorporating and winter flooding. These are all things that are going to help decompose residue and help uh, reduce the inoculum source for next season. Uh, the disease is favored by excess nitrogen, so you want to keep your nitrogen rates um, moderate. Uh, and also, thick stands tend to be more uh, favorable for, the, for this disease. The fungicide quadris is registered. Uh, and you, you'll find it on the label. The other fungicide used in California is Stratego. It's, uh, I think it's on the label as it provides suppression but not control. But in general, fungicides are not all that um, successful reducing infections of these diseases. These, these diseases are, are hard to control with fungicides. Um, another disease that has a similar cycle to stem rot is aggregate she spot. It, uh, about the same time during tillering, you start seeing lesions uh, on, the, on the tillers. It also overwinters or uh, uh, survives in crop residue as sclerotia. And in this case, nitrogen does not favor the disease, excess nitrogen, but uh, it has been found that fields with lower potassium uh, content seem to have more of this disease than, than fields with a higher or more appropriate level of potassium. And so the lesions appear at the same time that a stem rod, but they're different. They're more gray in color, and they have a well-defined border. And these lesions, uh, as the disease progresses, they don't penetrate the column, but they move up. So they'll start moving up in. Um, in the tiller, and they can go all the way up to the flag leaf. Uh, then they, they, you start seeing the flag leaf turning yellow and dying back. Uh, usually, when you see that, you go you go to the to the uh, to the color, and you'll find that there's a, a lesion there. And it can also get all the way to the panicle and and just produce a a blank uh, panicle, or a, or maybe not a panic. It doesn't produce a panicle at all. And that's what this sclerotia looks like. These are a little different. They're more irregular shaped. And again, you peel one of these lesions late in the season, and you start seeing these things form. Management is similar. Uh, you want to reduce your source of inoculum. So uh, burning, decomposing the straw, uh, removing the straw uh, can help. Um, Fungicides are available. Quadra Stratego, Stratego are labeled for um, aggregate she spot. But like I said, control with, with these fungicides for stem rod and aggregate she spot is, is really um, is not all that great. OK, so next, the next disease that we start seeing about this time after uh, maybe towards the end of tillering uh, and going into the reproductive stage of the rice plants is blast. Blast is the uh, most uh, uh, important disease of rice worldwide. Um, it was first seen in California in 1996. And before that, it was believed that blast could not really develop in California because of our dry uh, seasons. Um, but we've seen some. Uh, some years where blast really uh, has produced uh, uh, vast uh, infections and yield, yield reductions. 
Um, so it's different than other diseases in that blast uh, dispersed by air, their spores can fly in the air and move from one field or from one region to the other. And it's a multiple cycle disease, meaning that one, an infection can produce spores and those spores within the same season will infect other tissue or other plants or other fields and produce more spores and they just continue doing this for several times during the season. And so the, the, um, the expansion of the disease can be quite, uh, quite rapid. It's very dependent on environmental conditions and the conditions that favor blast are, uh, you need a, a layer of free moisture on the plants, so leave uh, some standing water, high relative humidity and moderate temperatures. So when we get um, summers with really hot temperatures, uh, we tend to see less of this disease and in general less of all diseases. So. Last year, we had a, a, a period of maybe two weeks um, during uh, about this time of the year where it was really hot. And I think because of that, we really didn't see much blast last year. So we didn't, when it's really hot, blast just doesn't do very good. So you'll see that uh, the disease starts with these small uh, diamond-shaped lesions uh, that have a a yellow halo around them. And then as the disease progresses, these lesions uh, start coalescing and you can, you can see uh, leaves that are just totally infected and a lot of times can be confused with herbicide damage uh, or other type of uh, toxicities. Um, a lot of times what you find is these areas, especially in the headlands where the aqua rig turns and Sometimes there's a little bit of overlap, and so there's, uh, there's uh, uh, more nitrogen in those areas. You see these pods where the, uh, the plants have just totally been burned down by the blast. And that's because this disease, just like uh, stem rot, uh, is favored by excess nitrogen. And in some cases, we've seen fields that just uh, have very large areas uh, affected by blast. And so any of the uh, aerial parts of the plant can be infected. We, you can have um, a color blast, node blast, and we just change the, how we call the disease depending on what tissue is infected. So leaf blast is just on the leaves. But what the, what we, um, what the most uh, problematic uh, aspect of the disease is when you get panicle infections. And so we call this panicle blast when the no, right below the panicle gets infected, and then this panicle just blanks out. And I've seen sometimes where uh, n not the, this node gets infected, but the little uh, branches within the panicle, some of them get infected, and then you have certain areas of the panicle that are blanked. Um, we have one cultivar that is resistant to one of the races that we have in California, and that's M208. Uh, a few years ago, we found some M208 plants that were showing blast symptoms, and that's when we found out that we have uh, more than one race uh, in California. But since then, really, we haven't seen um, this race take over or, or be more uh, uh, of a problem than uh, what the, the most common race that we have. Uh, so M208 is still a good variety in areas where blast is endemic and fields where you see blast every year. Uh, M206 is not resistant, but it, uh, it, it is a little bit more tolerant than other varieties, especially 205 and 104. Those are not recommended if you are in an area where you usually see blast. Um, <clears throat> a good a um, strategy to decrease the risk of uh, blast infections is keeping the water in your field. So it's really not understood why, but whenever you drain a field, say even for stand establishment uh, or uh, for weed control or for any other reasons you lose the water, uh, those fields tend to have uh, more severe blast infections that fields that have a constant uh, 
constant flow throughout the season. Nitrogen is very favorable, favorable for this disease, so avoid excess nitrogen. And um, blast can survive in crop residue, so uh, reducing the amount of inoculum can help. However, because this disease moves, the spores move through the air, uh, it's not 100%. Um, I mean, you can incorporate your straw, or you can burn, or you can uh, remove the straw. But if a uh, field down the road has blast, you can get a, an infection from that field. So it's not 100% uh, uh, effective. Uh, the Quadris and Stratego are registered for blast, and they give uh, good control. But uh, the key here is scouting and detecting blast early so that you can make um, your fungicide treatments at an appropriate time. So this, the way these fungicides work, they prevent the germination of the spores. So if you have a bunch of infections in your field, when you do a fungicide treatment with these products, they're not going to uh, kill those kill the fungus infecting your plants at that point. They're just going to prevent the spores that are being produced from germinating. So early detection is important. We don't recommend treating uh, leaf blast because it's usually not very bad. Um, but that would be a good sign that you might have to do a treatment to protect the panicles. Probably you want to do a treatment uh, you know, at the boot stage or right as the panicles are emerging from the boot to try to protect them from an infection. Okay, so those are the really major diseases we see in rice and the ones that may require some management action. Uh, like I said, we have a couple of diseases that are um, really not causing problems, but they are out there and you might run into them. Kernel smut seems to be increasing a little bit. Uh, at least last year, uh, growers in Glen County and Sutter County seem to have seen more of this disease. Not to the point that it would require a treatment, um, but they were interested in knowing what was, what was uh, the disease about. And so this is another uh, pathogen that infects uh, the flowers while, while they're open, up while they are open. And so the fungus starts growing in the kernel and produces these black mass of spores that are usually easily seen in the morning because they swell with the morning dew. And then during the day, they kind of, the moisture evaporates and they, they kind of go back to normal size and they're a little harder to find. Um, Uh, this disease is favored by, again, leaf wetness, so uh, uh, some moisture present in, in the tissue, and uh, high nitrogen rates. So um, we're seeing that in areas, I, I think that we're, the areas where we're seeing this disease kind of um, increase their, its incidence, it's areas that are, tend to have longer periods of dew in the morning, and there's not much of a breeze say like further south, like in Yolo County and the south, southern part of Calusa County. Um, the fungicides uh, have, have this disease listed in uh, their label, but at this point we're not recommending any treatment because it, it's not to the point that uh, we're seeing yield reductions. And the other disease that we have uh, out there but not, not very spread out is false mud. This is another fungus that infects the, the flowers and then produces this uh, mass of spores that are uh, orange inside and then they darken and then they get this, this appearance on the outside. And I've only seen this disease one time. It was, uh, it was in Glen County uh, a number of years ago. So, uh, you know, you might run into it and wonder what that is. Um, it's really interesting to see. Anyway, so that's what I have. Are there any questions? No? Good. Thank you.